because nothing costs a dollar anymore. So you, you, you two pennies each time you go up a dollar. Louise, okay, you do the fucking math in your head. Buenos Micronesia, I'm Troy Torres. And I'm Johnny Rosario. And we're here for Candid News from our studios here in Hagania. Welcome to all of you, much to the chagrin of some of people who may watch because they don't, they just can't help themselves. The flu did not kill me. <laughs> and here I am, motherfuckers. <laughs> uh, where are you all from? Can you please comment? Well, okay, we're here in Agania. Um, the most boring city on Guam after hours. Uh, Johnny's here in Agania. Yeah. After 5 p.m. What, what? Yeah, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a special shout out to, well, we have an audience member uh, whom we love and whose mother we love. So uh, lots of thoughts and prayers and love to our friend Vivian Leon. Uh, and thank you, Lonnie for gracing us. Oh, and for these cookies. Yeah, Thank and you. snacks. She brought some snacks. Yeah, yeah we love you for that. Um, before we get into uh, all these topics, and some of them, like a lot of them are just funny, um, may we ask that you go to the bottom right corner of your screen and press share. Bottom left. Oh, sorry, bottom left? Yeah. Oh, bottom left of your screen and press share. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and share this live stream to your timeline and to uh, the pages that you're in. Um, it, it's been very successful so far. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and thank you for allowing us into your homes or wherever you are actually. Um, if you're watching us on the road, please pay attention to the road first. Um, and, and, and yeah, and we'll just, you don't have to watch, we'll, we'll, we'll make you laugh just by listening to what we have to say. So the very first thing we want to bring up is uh, breaking news. Um, you saw it first on Candid News. It's, it, uh, it has absolutely no newsworthiness, but for all the business telltale people out there, can we go to my screen, Chalu? Sure. Look what we found. Mm hmm. McLeod was picked up, captured by the marshals, but not for Dick Sucking. I've actually never seen a picture of him before. Well, that's McClyde. He apparently had something. Uh, he, if the marshals are involved, that means he, ha he has a warrant, right? Yes. Well, why would he have a warrant? Like For terrorizing and family violence. Probably not checking in. You know, the usual. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is he part Palawan? Oh, he's full Palawan? He looks full Olay. Palawan. McClyde, don't worry. I'm plowing. I've been arrested too. This gives you some street cred. All right. So um, the next thing, um, do we go? Do we go through all the like funny stuff first, and then? No, I think the that stuff and then the funny stuff. Okay. So let's rehash earlier today. Um, Johnny and I brought you uh, some news from Congressman Mike Sinicolis, and. <coughs> We read you a news release from him about how um, the House of Representatives in their resolution, which would um, permanently grant the territories um, Medicaid equity, as in Medicaid funding equity in um, the matching formulas between what the federal government matches and what the local governments would match for Medicaid uh, that House resolution was joined by um, a Senate version um, signed on by eight Democratic senators, including Bernie Sanders, who led the, who led the way, but along with some uh, other presidential candidates. So it's like a, a star-powered um, uh, twin version of what the House introduced. And 
to make a long story short, this is a significant measure that the congressman is helping to push through Congress and get to the president's desk that uh, if passed, if, if signed into law, uh, would take our matching um, requirements for Medicaid from 55% on the federal government's part to something around 80% on the federal government's part. It would, uh, it would free up millions of dollars in local funding for other projects, but also removes the cap for Medicaid funding. So Johnny and I were talking about this earlier, what this essentially means uh, aside from you know the freeing up of funding is that um, more doctors and clinics would have an incentive to accept Medicaid patients. Could you want to explain that more? And that's because they're guaranteed payments. Pretty much guaranteed. Yeah. Like right with now, it's like not. Yeah. yeah. And then and then also with the um, what is it called when you um, get a physical um, preventive care? Preventive care. So, so like public health centers will be more engaged in things like preventive care because they're not, they're no longer doing the three weeks to three months wait for right. primary care visits. Yes. Um, for people looking for appointments because. And people will actually be better because they're not going to wait till they're dying to go to GMH. Yeah. So this is, I mean, and we're just brushing the surface of what this could mean for Guam because the, it would have significant impact on. Um, the healthcare on the industry, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that with the, this kind of restructuring um, of Medicaid's financials on this island, because currently, if you if you go to a clinic that does accept Medicare, they're only they only allow so many patients per day under Medicare, or I mean Medicaid. So some clinics will only take three patients that day. Um, so if you don't catch that, then you won't be able to see the doctor. And that's why it takes so long. Yes. To get an appointment mm -hmm. if you're under Medicaid, the the other thing that uh, was in the congressman's release was um, uh, funding for prescription drugs for low-income senior citizens uh, under Medicaid, not under Medicare. So Medicare has uh, Part D, mm -hmm. which is uh, coverage for prescription drugs, right. but it's expensive. Very expensive. And it's not even something that is available to GovGuam employees and retirees right. because we're not, part they're not that. part of that plan, right? right. So. Um, this measure from the country, it has significant um, Impact. impacts all around, not just fiscally, but also um, in the medical industry. And so we applaud him for that. Uh, it, it's a significant feat. And I mean, I guess something that congressmen have been trying to do for many, many years, and he's a freshman. Right. And he's been able to get shit done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the governor, I believe, also discussed this in a release from the Western Governors Association mm -hmm. today. What did she say about it? You read it. I didn't, I didn't read the release. went there to meet them to get this. It, it's kind of weird. I, I think we need to talk. We need to figure that out, that she's saying she's the one doing the extra measures to take care of war claims and um, this Medicaid thing. But then another press release came out, and that was Michael C. Nicholas's press release. So they're... I, I'm, I'm not sure what's going on over there. Well, I, it, with the war claims thing, um, it's out in the open now that uh, when Adelute came out with their use of um, seems to be million. freed up Medicaid funds mm -hmm. for war it, claims, that the congressman said he was not consulted. Yeah, he wasn't consulted, and it, it, it'll ruin. It'll set the clock back. Yeah. So there's a problem. Like they need to talk to each other. Yeah. Or they, like whoever at the governor's office probably needs to pick up the phone and give Congressman to Nicholas a call, so that you know this kind of thing doesn't hurt people. Basically. Yeah. Or if 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 that really can't be done, if the 5.6 million cannot be used to pay those war uh, war claims, then why say it? If there's money that's coming already for that. It, you know, and why why do that to the people? Well, I, I'd hate to think this, but I mean, it, it is a possibility. I've seen it before, where um, when you're when you have competing political interests, um, you know, one or both interests are always trying to have that aha moment over the other. Mm -hmm. You know, like oh, we did it first, or we were the ones who did this, and not the other person. Or what, I, I hope it's not something like that. Well, we're one Guam, so. <laughs> 
I don't know, there's so many examples of how that's just so not true. We're one Guam. It's supposed <laughs> to be one Guam. It's supposed to be. In the perfect Guam utopia, in the Gutopia. Well, get over it already and let's move forward, people. Yeah, right? Well, uh, Adeloop is moving forward with other healthcare news and it is causing quite a controversy mm -hmm. and it is um, the Bureau of Women's Affairs push to find uh, an abortion doctor because currently there are no doctors who conduct elective abortion procedures, right? That's right. That's what it is. Uh, what had happened was the last guy just kind of retired, right? Yes. Um, Dr. Freeman. Dr. Freeman? Yeah. Was it Dr. Freeman and his wife also Dr. No, Freeman? No, I, I, I don't Dr. know. Dr. Freeman. It was just Dr. Freeman. Oh, okay. And uh, so um, that is a major concern to the Bureau of Women's Affairs. And so they're going out and they're, I, well, I think this is an unprecedented kind of thing. I mean, GMH would normally scout out for doctors uh, in needed areas, I've never heard of Adelaide scouting out a doctor, much less an abortion doctor. Yeah, I, I'm not, there's, it's just using taxpayers' money to figure out, because the government getting involved in what we do personally as women to our own bodies is, is a big, um, that's a controversy. So that's a, that's an interesting point. So I, I'm not, I, I'm actually not pro-choice. Uh, but I'm also not a woman, so I'm just going to shut my mouth about that. <laughs> good call, so, Troy. Good call. <laughs> so, um, for uh, my pro-choice friends, we were having a discussion about this today. Mm -hmm. One of them said a big reason that she's pro-choice is because they don't, she's never wanted the government involved in these decisions to begin with. So, I mean, this is sort of a new angle where now you have the government involved. And to her, it's like, I didn't want you involved in the first place. I certainly don't want you involved now. Yeah. Like, I don't want the government involved in these sort of decisions. Uh, and that's precisely what, what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's actually one of the biggest arguments for choice is right. uh, government intervention. I, I, just, I just feel like if you're going to do it, whether it's electively or if it, we do need it for medical, I mean, I mean, Dr. Shea says he'll do it if, it, if the mother's at risk. For medical emergency. Right, yeah. but if you're gonna do it electively, you gotta deal with your God at the end of at, at the end of your term, you know. So it's your choice. I, I'm not ever. I could never judge anybody on their decision. But when people's lives are involved, when that mother's life is involved, or the baby's at risk for whatever reason, then it's really up to the physician. So Dr. Shea actually brought up another point. He said. We need uh, rheumatologists, we need cardiologists, we need specialists in this, that, and the other area. Why is it that so this is taking um, a priority mm -hmm. over all of these other needs that people have? Right. Oh, that sound of the, of that, that's my dog, Gus. <laughs> um, so, uh, interesting, interesting controversy as it is. Oh, the, the WhatsApp group chats are flooding with... Um, supporters of Lou, like, and now they're like, we need to take a stance, and she oh, like wants. Anti? Yeah, now they're like, anti? now they're saying we need to take a stand, and because it's a sin, and yeah, <laughs> and they're pro, they're pro Lou, you know. But they are right in, now. yeah, but not with this topic. They're not. Interesting. Very interesting. And I just think that we also need to look at the children that are born that are left behind. There's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, well, speaking of that, uh, there were two children whose death sparked a civil lawsuit challenging Guam's medical arbitration law. So the death of uh, four-year-old Asher Dean Lebowski on October 31 last year, and forgive me because I don't know the date of, um, of Babyface had Lee's death, and I believe it happened in October of last year as well, right? I'm not sure, Troy. I, I, I think it did. I, I think she was born uh, at GRMC in October of 2018, and she died <coughs> shortly after. Um, both of them uh, were MRSA infected and succumbed to septic shock. Um, both involved um, allegations of medical malpractice. Um, and so there are lawsuits um, 
against medical providers on the island, but also uh, to provide injunctive relief um, based on a law from 1991. So, okay, if, if a doctor through malpractice kills your relative at wherever, GMA, CRMC, a clinic, wherever it is, right? you cannot go to the superior court and file a lawsuit directly. You would have to enter into arbitration first. And in order to enter arbitration, you have to pay for that arbitration to start. And uh, by all accounts, the lowest the minimum payment is $10,000. So unless you got $10,000 just laying around, and that's just the start. That's not what, even what the is, Okay, if, I, if I'm suing and I have to put that, where does that money go? What is it for? It goes it's into for a the, bank account? It's it for the arbitration. So there is, um, look, I, I can review this right now. There's, um, what does that mean? It, it means that this panel of three arbiters are going to determine whether your case can advance to the superior court um, for a medical malpractice. Suit. So that $10,000 is going to go into the pockets of those three people? It pays for, no, no, I think that's like for your attorney to start filing things. That's okay. for your attorney's cost. Okay. So um, in 1991, uh, the legislature, and it was, a, it was through public law 21-43, authored by then Senator David Shimizu, let me just bring this sucker out. Uh, authored by Senator David Shimizu, Senator Joe T. Sinagasin, and Senator Madeline Bergaglio, co-sponsored by all others. I think this is complete. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, twenty-one. Yeah, all twenty-one senators at the time. Um, and there's actually a little bit of history to this, but. It's called the Medical Malpractice Mandatory Arbitration Act. And it says, any claim that accrues or is being pursued in the, oh, can we go to my screen? Shelly, sorry, so people can. It just went on. It just went on? Yeah. Any claim that accrues or is being pursued in the territory of Guam, whether in tort, contract, or otherwise, shall be submitted to mandatory arbitration pursuant to the terms of this chapter if it is a controversy between the patient, his relatives, his heirs at law, or a personal representative, or any third party or other party, and the health professional or healthcare institution, or their employees or agents, and is based on malpractice, tort, contract, strict liability, or any other alleged violation of legal duty incident to the acts of the health professional or healthcare institution, or incident to services rendered, or to be rendered by the health professional or healthcare institution. In layman's terms, if the doctor fucks up and you are severely injured or you die or whatever, um, you cannot go to court to sue for malpractice until arbitration uh, decides that that happens. Arbitration is initiated by a petitioner or petitioners serv serving a written demand for arbitration upon a respondent or respondents in the same manner provided by the law for the service of summons in the Superior Court of Guam, except that the petitioner or his agent may serve the demand without the necessity of it being served by a marshal of the Superior Court of Guam. The demand for arbitration shall not be filed in the Superior Court of Guam, and arbitration shall not be filed in the Superior Court of Guam unless the petitioner or petitioners require the appointment of a guardian ad litem. Blah, 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 blah. The demand for arbitration shall state the name and address of the petitioner or petitioners, identify the respondent, and shall outline the factual basis of the claim and the alleged acts of negligence or wrongdoing of the respondent or respondents. And so it lays out like a whole process. It defines certain things. It says who um, is this association that would choose the three arbiters. And the association, at least uh, when this law was passed, means the American Arbitration Association or other entity organized to arbitrate disputes pursuant to this chapter. Uh, then there's, it, it's a whole like list of things, whatever. So essentially what this was meant to do um, was to, uh, 
prevent lots of different lawsuits from making it to the Superior Court of Guam against doctors. And this is not the first iteration of this law. This is, this 1991 law is a response to um, an original law in 1984 um, that was declared unconstitutional in Awa versus GMH um, by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, that 1984 law is, is this one. It is, we're still on my screen, right? It was signed into law by Governor Ricky Berdalio on December 23, 1975. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a 1984 law, it's a 1975 law by the 13th Guam Legislature. It was introduced by former Senator Ernesto S. Baldon, um, and it, it, it's, the, it's for the prompt and effective resolution of medical malpractice claims. So these were, in that first law that I, that I showed you, the 1991 law, there was no statement of legislative intent, but in this one, um, it, it, it's, it's right here. It says the health of the territory's people is the foundation of the territory's productivity, strength, and well-being. Adequate medical care for all Guam citizens is the necessity of living, resulting from the provision of comprehensive health care as an incidence of rising medical practice claims. Higher judgments, settlements, and the filing of suits are increasing the cost of malpractice insurance and making it unavailable altogether. It is essential to assure the resolution of malpractice claims with optimum efficiency, both for the benefit of the consumer and the medical profession. Mandatory screening of medical malpractice claims and mandatory arbitration of valid claims will provide an effective alternative to litigation. Arbitration is widely accepted as a forum for the settlement of such disputes, and there is a definite role in the malpractice problem for the government of Guam. This is 1975. This is like an entire uh, era ago where one, arbitration wouldn't have been that expensive. Two, um, the availability of medical malpractice in the insurance industry, uh, medical malpractice insurance in the insurance industry would yes have been very expensive in 1975 during a period of maturing um, uh, insurance industry. Uh, three, not too many doctors available or wanting to come to Guam. So. Lots has, lots has changed, a lot has changed since 1975. A lot has changed since 1991, yet we still have on our books this medical arbitration law uh, that in 1975 may have made sense, but in 2019 uh, no longer may be in the public interest. And in the case of, well, just about anybody, not just Astor Dean Lebowski and Babyface Heidegger and their families, and they're in the cases of anybody who has a serious malpractice claim against a doctor or a hospital or a clinic, unless you've got the money, you're not going to be able to make that claim. You are not going to be able to get the justice that you deserve, and people are not going to be able to know about the malpractice of certain doctors who uh, have been slicing and dicing people um, unjustly or you know, without medical merit, uh, we'll never know about it because it will never reach anywhere because nothing can ever start because people can't afford it. So can you afford $10,000 right now? I can't afford $10,000 right now. I, like not many people can. It's not something. So imagine how many doctors have been getting away with medical malpractice because this law has existed in our books. And so um, Mr. Lebowski and the Tidegwees, their lawsuit isn't uh, just a high and dry medical malpractice lawsuit. It's challenging this law for the same reasons that this AWA person in AWA versus GMH challenged the 1975 law and got the 1991 um, uh, law instituted in its place. Uh, and that is for violation of a citizen's due process rights. Um, and actually in the, in the Organic Act, there are, the Organic Act is updated every now and then to include footnotes of, um, 
the court rulings that helped to define the act further and further. And in the, uh, in the section about the applicability of the fourth, the fourth and 14th amendments of the constitution to Guam, uh, this AWA versus GMH is one of those footnotes. Um, so Mr. Lubofsky and the tie degrees uh, are entering a very interesting uh, part of Guam's legal history uh, in, in their efforts to overturn this medical malpractice arbitration act from 1991. And if we can just be a little serious here about um, what our senators can do like to like do something meaningful for Guam, it doesn't take a court to overturn this law. Senators can very easily go into session and remove this section of the law if they really cared about serving the poor in this community. Yeah. Not as expensive, you know, with all the doctors that are out there now, out, out here now, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, why are poor people footing the bill for essentially what, uh, instead of doctors uh, footing the bill for their own medical malpractice insurance? Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't they pay for their own insurance? Like everybody else has to pay for their own insurance if it's available to them, yeah. right? Motherfuckers. So. Anything else? No. Oh, by the way, you can call us at 922-6397. Um, he said that will be challenged also. Which one? Uh, David Lebowski. He said that will be challenged also. Mm -hmm. Oh, Alwa versus GMH. Romeo says arbitration laws, the privatization of the justice system. Yeah, right. When you think about it, no kidding. It's like um, it's like taking litigation to a quasi court that doesn't necessarily respect people's due process rights, when you think about it. Um, let's follow back the seriousness to the Bobby Ho files. So we had heard that, <laughs> that Johnny's friend, Bobby Ho, the toy green, what's her last name? Is it She's everybody's green? friend. Or is it Cruz? She's everybody's friend. Yeah, everyone's friend. Um, <laughs> uh, her <laughs> name is, her last name's a uh, Cruz, a toy green Cruz. Well, she's trying to get a divorce, so I think. I don't know what you want to call her. She's called Petty Patricia, <laughs> or <laughs> uh, Pachata Patricia or something. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Okay, finish, finish. So, okay, so Bobby Ho works at Docomo. She's the Docomo of Docomo, <laughs> and apparently, like the Docomo executives, got wind of, of our, our show of our Bobby <laughs> of our Bobby Ho files, <laughs> and so they asked, and 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 you know what? Dokomo, we're gonna we're gonna do you a solid tonight because you asked Bobby Ho who Georgine Titano is, and you what did she say? She denied even knowing her. She she, she didn't she didn't know some some psycho chick apparently. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dokomo executives, you know, and and hey, we're giving you some some marketing here tonight, you know, like name placement and all. Dokomo, we just want you to know that Georgine Titano is uh, Bobby Joe's mother. And Bobby Joe's uh, current fling, the balding guy, Larry, that's Georgine's ex, her party. Yeah, yeah. so there's the, that, that is, we just connected the dots for you because. Um, yeah, just do you a solid docomo, yeah. you know? And, and just so you know that Bobby Ho is a fucking doctrine. And if she'll lie to you about that, imagine what else she'll lie to you about. She has a sickness. It's called diabetes. <laughs> it explains her weight gain. Um, so, um, we're going to bring up Paul Salas, uh, but not because he did anything stupid and funny, but stupid and disgusting. And um, Do we have Paul Salas stuff to put up on the screen so people can remember? How he looks? Yeah, from the. F He's like on the name that lesbian file and the. Stretch, stretch. Stretch, stretch. <laughs> so, 
Paul Salas, if you remember, is part of the Frickin' Frack series. Um, the recordings that we had that um, where he and Frank Roberto, who's the former administrator of the Port Safety Office, um, are heard in these recordings conspiring uh, to lie uh, to investigators in the Port 7 case so that they and Mike Phillips <coughs> would get off the hook for their um, criminal actions. And Paul Salas was the really, just the stupid one, like the really, really dumb one. Yeah. I mean, they were he both kind of like dumb, but yeah, he looks. <laughs> yeah, and they filed, they filed harassment <laughs> on Troy. <laughs> Him and his wife. For phone calls to the governor's office. Fucking pussies. So, Paul looks like, um, Lesbian. Yeah, but not not just any kind of lesbian. Like a butch. Like, what kind of car does he drive? What kind of car does this he lesbian drive? He probably drives a big truck to compensate for his small. Like a Ford F three fifty. Maybe like that. Like a Ford F three fifty. What color yeah. is it? It's. I, I don't know. It's, it's white, right? It's white. <laughs> I don't know. No, it, it's fucking but white. Yeah. And he uses a step stool to to wash probably, it every yes, day. Yes. Like the lesbian he is. <laughs> and he even sounds like a lesbian. Jesus Christ. Like, he has, like, all the makings of a person. Yeah, his wife might as well be a lesbian. I feel like we're insulting lesbians too much, though, because Paul Solis is a piece of no, fucking No, they work. know. They're, they're not as sensitive as Paul Solis and his they're wife. They're not sensitive at all. Yeah. They're tough. <laughs> but not Paul Solis. Yeah, so Paul Solis... What, what Paul Solis mean? shot his neighbor's puppy. Um, I don't know if I have it on... I have it. You have it? Can, can you... Um, what do you call that thing? Airdrop it? Yeah. Let me show you this. It's, I think the, I think his neighbor's name is Susie Akpaji. So, I think her name is Susie Akpaji. Susie's puppy, not even like a full-grown dog, but a puppy, um, just went into Paul Solis's yard to play with his other dogs. wasn't causing any problems. Oh, what happened? Save to download. Are you on his screen, Chris? <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> oh, sorry, I sent the wrong. I'm sorry, that Are was you the wrong. You can go to my screen, then. <laughs> that's okay. Can you send the right one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna send the right. Sorry, wrong one, guys. <laughs> Let me just get the right one. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> there you go. Got it. Found it. <laughs> okay, Johnny provided another <laughs> picture that you can run there. <laughs> okay, there. All right. Yes, her name is Susie Akpaji. Okay, so we can, are you guys still on my screen? Okay, so <coughs> that's her puppy on the right. Well, that's also her puppy on the left with the gunshot wound. The puppy died. Um, so the puppy was just in Paul Solis' yard, not causing any problems, n like, just playing with the other, and Paul Solis, the piece of shit, shot this puppy to death. I don't know if the puppy died, but it, it doesn't say. Oh, how did, how do I, how did I get that the puppy died? Did I just make that up in my head? Yeah, because it's Paul Solis' name. Oh. Okay, we don't know if the puppy died, sorry. <laughs> okay, so hopefully the puppy's alive. So, I don't know, the, it's not bleeding. The, there's a wound and it's not bleeding, so doesn't that mean? I, I don't know. It doesn't even say if the puppy passed away or what. She's heartbroken. I know, but... Oh, Susie, if you're listening or if you're watching, please call, if you want to call on the show to tell the story about what happened and to just rip Paul Solace a new one, our number is 9226397. Actually, any of you can call and talk to us live, or um, if you want us to screen it first, because you don't, like, we'll screen it first to see if you want to go on live, or if you just want to tell us something, um, like, give us a tip to say on the show or whatever, and you want to remain anonymous. So Susie says, the Bible says to love thy neighbor, not shoot their dog. So Paul Salas, I don't know how you sleep at night, knowing how cruel you are to an animal, not just an animal, but a puppy and playful one at that. The dog was not vicious at all, never did it attack anyone or another animal. 
Her hashtags are fucking hilarious, though. Hashtag karma. Hashtag God does not sleep. Hashtag you will get what you deserve. Hashtag $50 man. <laughs> Hashtag toilet paper man. <laughs> if you want to know what that inside joke is, just go back to our freaking frack series. Mm -hmm. And you'll love it. But, Susie, man, I hope your dog is still alive. And, you know... I mean, if Paul Salas ever steps onto your property, there is something called a castle doctrine. And, like, all you have to say is that Paul Salas tried to look at you in the eyes and turn you to stone with how ugly she is. And, like, and then that's your defense, you know? Like, he was trying to kill you with his ugliness. That's why you had to shoot him, you know? Like, I'm just kidding. I'm just, of course, I would never... I would never ever want to incite violence against Yeah, he would people. call me. <laughs> 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 Fuck Paul Salas, what a piece of shit. Um, earlier today we also... Um, we also brought you the very disturbing story about uh, GPD's first arrest for heroin possession in years. I don't know when's the last time, but this yeah. would be... Even uh, Sergeant Paul Tepal was... Surprised. Yeah, he was surprised by the whole thing. Um, and uh, so we had a whole conversation with him. Oh, let me back it up. The, it, it, it's an Anthony Frank mm -hmm. H. Cruz, born in 1987. So born in September of 1987, so he is still 31 years old. Um, he was pulled over on Route 8 uh, because the officer noticed that he was veering onto oncoming lanes, mm -hmm. uh, and they noticed him like, like, <laughs> going like this to the, <laughs> yeah, something to the steering wheel. Like he was just lethargic. I mean, I guess we can't even say twacked out, right? He was like, he was out of it, yeah. definitely. And um, they, long story short, they did a search and they found heroin and syringes. Um, well, what? what tested presumptive positive for heroin. Um, and so when we saw the magistrates complain about that, it kind of, it, well, it did freak out Johnny and I. Uh, and that's why we had to get back on live real fast and uh, let you guys know about it. Mm -hmm. So we called Sergeant Paul Tapal, and what did he say? That, that we need to be more vigilant and if that, if that, if he's for sure this is not an isolated case. That if this guy has heroin, then yeah. other people have heroin. So if we could be more vigilant with our families um, and let them know if any any activity, weird activity is going on, to call call the police department. But on, on the other end, families that love each other, families that love their um, child or cousin or sister, brother, if if you feel like um, someone in your family does have a problem and you need help. Um, New Beginnings actually already has a uh, plan in place for heroin addicts. Mm -hmm. So um, his name is Dean, and his phone number is 475... 5438. 5440. 5445. Something. Yeah, 475-5445. His name is Dean. And um, if, you, if they're not ready for treatment, but you as a family need to um, know more or how to approach the, the, um, the addict, they're more than willing to help. Um, he says there's a few cases um, already that exist, so they do have a plan in place for heroin and opiates. So um, across the United States, um, from what started in the inner cities and now is branching into suburban areas, I think that's what Paul Tapal told us, right? Mm -hmm. Branching into the suburban areas, so you know, it kind of makes sense. Guam is like suburban, and our, our inner cities are uh, these international Asian cities around us where um, it's conceivable that the heroin comes from, right? Um, there is, uh, wh what happens is um, society, these or these cities or whatever, they start off with <coughs> the abuse of prescription drugs um, that are op opiates? Opiates, op yeah. That are opiates. Um, so like your Percocets, Vicodin, 
stuff that if you have pain and you as a parent get that prescribed and you don't use it, kids usually take that and start using that and that's how it starts. Or it's also like um also like um doctors that are just prescribing willy nilly, right? That's, that's yeah, but they're cracking state. down on, on, on those on those doctors. So now they are. Oh yeah. yeah. Now they are. But um it's here on Guam. Um too I, late. Yeah, it's here. Too late. So the so the prescription drug epidemic um, in all of these inner cities now spreading into suburban America uh, graduates at, at a certain point when a certain threshold is met. And that threshold normally is someone figures out that heroin is the same thing and, and it's, it, cheaper. it's cheaper. Um, so the government of Guam for several years has had this on its radar um, and I, I'm not sure if the court system has been in sync with the executive branch's efforts to, um, and the federal oh, yeah, government's yeah. efforts, right? Because the federal government is, is hot on prescription yeah. pills, right? Uh, to deal with the prescription drug epidemic and prevent it from turning into a heroin epidemic. For several years, that has been the concern of the government. Um, and I guess they always knew that this day would come. So this day has come. It's was it, yes, it was yesterday that this happened, that this pullover happened, uh, and it is uh, definitely not an is I don't think it's an isolated case at all. Yeah. Like, heroin didn't just appear in this guy's living room. You know what I mean? Scary. Yeah, it is, it is scary. I, I wasn't, we weren't, we were just babies during the heroin epidemic, yeah. right? I've never tried it. Neither have I. I, I I've seen it, like, it, it's uh, weird and disturbing to say the least, right? Mm-hmm. And and people will go through great lengths. If you think ice is addicts bad. would go through great lengths to get their fix, I don't think you've seen anything yet. Yeah. Heroin is Guam is get ready for a rude awakening. So hopefully the government can get this under control and can approach the heroin problem in a much better way than the government has over the years approached the ice problem. Um, anything else on that? Mm-mm. No? Okay. Uh, so the last two things, we're just going to go um, go over some of your rights. If you are like an apartment, if you're like an apartment renter or you live in a townhouse or something, or if you're a small business owner and you rent uh, from uh, a building or something, I'm going to go over some some of your rights under GTA's laws, and then we'll end it with um, sex offenders from Mong Mong Tsu Mai Ti. So, I'll do that. We can go to my screen, Chalu. Back in 1997, the legislature passed, um, passed a law is it this one? The legislature passed a law to protect um, a lot of small businesses uh, and renters from landlords who were ripping them off. And not just, they weren't just ripping off uh, these small businesses and um, renters. Uh, by ripping them off, they also ripped off Guam Power Authority. And this is in the installation of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a cool, he's a cool guy actually. Okay. Um, well, I'm trying to find the stupid section of the law. I thought I had it open. <laughs> oh yeah, unauthorized electrical connections, Article Four. So, if you have a submeter, like so, if you're if you're renting um, an apartment or a condo or something, um, or if you're a if you have a lease at a building, if you're a small business, 
um, you likely have a sub-meter. And sub-meters are fine. They're authorized under the law, but only if Guam Power Authority knows about it. You see, the sub-meter is attached to government property. It's attached to an electric meter, which is a Guam Power Authority piece of property. And these meters are what measure the amount of power that you're using. And so you can't just have anyone installing these sub-meters, and you certainly can't have the landlord just installing it whenever the landlord wants. And that's what was happening, and it caused lots of problems with um, the power authority back in 19, before 1997. Oh, here, legislative findings and intent. Are we on my screen? It says the Guam legislature finds that GPA is faced with attempting to recover millions of dollars in lost revenue resulting from unauthorized electrical connections or illegal hookups. The problem has manifested itself in various forms perpetrated by not only residential users, but by contractors and businesses as well. Between November 1995 through September 1996, 76 meter tampering cases were reported to GPA and 63 cases were reported as theft to the Guam Police Department. In most cases, the individuals involved were not penalized because the thefts are classified as misdemeanors. The legislature also finds that with the increase in delinquent accounts, disconnections flow follow, which many times leads to an increase in unauthorized electrical connections and inactive accounts. The cycle oftentimes recurs, resulting in wasted GPA manpower and materials that in turn will eventually lead to higher costs. The legislature also realizes that illegal, illegally tapping into and tampering with the power system is a safety hazard that endangers lives and property. In anticipation of continued unauthorized use of electricity, the Guam legislature finds that it is imperative that stringent measures be taken to put an end to such illegal activities. So the legislature made it illegal to make these submeter connections without GPA's permitting. An illegal power hookup is any connection to power lines which belong to the government of Guam that is made without the prior written permission of the Guam Power Authority or any ho power hookup from a direct power line which bypasses or hinders meter registration. The conditions include but are not limited to external jumpers, bypass on meter, tap ahead of electric meter, inverted electric or reverse substitution meter, manipulation of meter dials, foreign materials inside electric meter, open potential line, unmetered theft of service, metered theft of service, or any other unauthorized or illegal hookup. So if you didn't know, now you know. If you're wondering uh, why your power bill seems to be a lot higher on s certain occasions, or you're just wondering how in the hell did I use that much power, it may be that your landlord is ripping you off, and your landlord will be more prone to ripping you off if the landlord already is ripping off Guam Power Authority. So these are your rights. Check it out. This is Article 12. I'm sorry, Art, uh, Chapter 8, Article 4 of Title 12, Guam Code Annotated. That's the title involving autonomous agencies like Guam Power Authority. Uh, and lastly, let's go to the Sex Offender Registry. Um, okay, left off here. Paul, Paul Cruz Minor, level one offender, born in 1964, <coughs> convicted in, well, three times, in 1994, in August 94, in uh, October 94, and in October 88. Um, this is weird. We had one victim for all three convictions. 
That's an interesting, that's an interesting story. So he, has, he was convicted three times, from, appears to be from the same minor, age 14 at the time. Um, convicted in 1988 of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony. Um, in August of 94 of kidnapping as a second degree felony and in October of 94 of felonious restraint as a third degree felony. Um, he lives on 469 Tuba Street. So this is Cars Plus, this is uh, Shop for Less. So if you go down this road here, you take a left on Roy T. Damian Street, then you take the second left and go all the way into the boondocks over here. And that's where he lives. He's fat. John Anthony Kichichu, level one offender, is definitely fat. Um, he's on probation. He was convicted in, he was born in 1978, convicted in 2017 on two counts of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony. How in the fuck is this guy not in jail? And his victim was six years old. His victim is six years old. Holy shit. He drives a brown 1989 hard body Nissan pickup, license plate in Arahan 2180. He lives at 240 Sergeant Roy T. Damian Street. Let's see what this is. He was just convicted in, in 2017. In November 2017, he's not even two years old. Holy shit. I'm gonna look into this case, see who the judge was. He lives near the church. He lives right across the church. There's the church, Immaculate Heart of Mary, I think. And this he lives right there. Son of a bitch. You um it's the Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, no shit. It's like learning something on Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> he sped out probably, right? And he let his ass go? I don't know. It's, uh... Oh, this is my friend. Tomas Kitachai. Level 1. Um, convicted in 2014 of... Distribution of obscene material as a misdemeanor. Victims were male, 9, 9, 11, 11, 11, and 12. Is that like distribution of porn? Mm -hmm. 141 D. Duenas Street. This is not mong mong. This is wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a D.
Dude, I get... Looks like that's the only Duane Street on Guam. Then you look into that address. William Fujita Sinicus Jr., level 3 offender. Definitely on the fat side. Convicted in 2010, sexual contact with a minor. One count. Uh, this occurred in Arizona. It was a 15 year old male, uh, female victim. This dude lives on 228-2 Manabusan Street. Works on Fujita Road. According to this map, he lives in the jungle in <laughs> It's probably this house over here. It's, it's, well, I don't want to guess that. He lives somewhere here. Oh, we're done with Mong Mong. All right, let's go to Totu. David Vicente Cabrera, born in 1942, is a level two offender, convicted in 2012, uh, one count of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony, and one count of child abuse as a misdemeanor over a 14 year old female victim, and he lives on 173 Clara Road. Is that the road to the school? And the school is back here, right? Yeah, there's the school. JT San Miguel, right? So he lives on the road to the school. Doroteo Quintanita Castro. Level three offender, born in 1941, convicted in 29, oh, just this year, March 2019, a fourth degree criminal sexual conduct as a misdemeanor over a 15 or 16 year old female victim. He lives on that same road, 201 Clara Road. Hey, they're neighbors. Like, no shit, just honest to God, right next to each other. Francisco Baza Castro, level one offender, born 1959, uh, convicted in 1999 of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony, as a lesser included offense of first degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony. I don't know what that means but it's over a female 13 years old. Um, he's employed on Titano Road in Smooning and lives at Kena Court. Well, I didn't know Kena Court was a Hemlani apartment. <laughs> well, it says not found. Well, let's take it. It says Kina Court, Haimlani Apartments, C9. Well, yeah, there's Kina Court. Right after McDonald's, right? Yeah.
All the old time druggies know about Kina Court, right? Mm -hmm. I remember Kina Court. Just like you're all saying, you know, like, do you remember um, uh, Epal Hotel? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> it's, it's called One Pacific now. It was called Fifty Shades of Grey at one point, I had heard. Mm -hmm. I was told. And it still has those red tiles in the bathroom, someone told me. It's sometimes blue. Hey, that's a special place. <laughs> <laughs> What's that, the penthouse? Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is, there, is there double parking? <laughs> Shit, I didn't know that. Joseph Perez Flores, level two offender. He doesn't look that fat in his picture, but he's fat. That's, that's fat. Born in 1967, convicted in 2002, uh, two counts. One count of attempted third degree criminal sexual conduct as a second degree felony. First count of fourth degree criminal sexual conduct as a misdemeanor. His victim was a 23 year old female. He is not employed, does not have a car. And he lives at 1072 Roy T. Damion Street. A lot of them live there, huh? That's like the main artery of um, yeah. MTM. <coughs> and Damion's in the spill. That could have been the problem with the other one. Where's this? Is that Ag Is this McDonald's right here? Yeah. Is this Tulsa Garden? Mm hmm This is Harvest. Oh, so he lives in one of these areas uh, off of Harvest on the other side of the street. And let's see. There, there. He lives there. You're pretty good at that. Yeah, I can do that. <coughs> Douglas Lee Harrison. He relocated. Oh. How come? Okay, I guess it doesn't matter then. Guy Lara, motherfucker. <laughs> Arnold Navarro Maristella, level three offender, born in 1952, convicted in 2004 of sexual battery as a misdemeanor 14-year-old uh, female victim. He lives at 1198 Tota Kenyatta Loop. And can I just say, if there's any place on Guam that needs one of those, this village is here signs, it's t between Totu Kenyatta and like Kenyatta Barragata. I can never figure out, going through that village, where in the fuck Barragata I love uh, to begins. Be to. It's every everything's so close. Um, in the inside. Yeah. Yeah, I like I like that area. <coughs> oh, this is um, he lives in Tulsa Gardens. <laughs> Frank Jesse Trufferis Nerdog, a level one offender, born in 1961, convicted in 1996 of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony against a 12 year old female. He has three cars, a blue 1989 uh, Nissan hard body pickup, license plate Hagatnia 5095. A Nissan pickup 1989 license plate H. I don't know if that makes uh, that might just be a typo, right? Um, and a 1990 maroon Toyota Hilux license plate 1207 FAP lives on 1194 Sergeant Roy T. Damian Street.
So he lives in the turn after uh, Tosu Gardens, that right turn after. Who's this? Is this the mayor's office right here? Or is that further down? Why is that the Y? See the Y? Oh, this is the store right here, right? Yeah. Manglonia store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this condo right here? I, I, oh, I don't know the name of it. I think Mayor... Mayor Villa Gomez's house is like uh, this one, I think. Yeah, I think it's this one. Okay, so there, he lives there. Vicente Tobis Nededog. Is that the brother or sister? They look alike, right? Yeah. Level three offender is fat. Uh, convicted in 2008 of fourth degree criminal sexual conduct as a misdemeanor. Uh, victim is 14 year old female. Well, they, they must be brothers because they like Nissan pickups. So he has a 2006 maroon Nissan Pathfinder license plate. His, he's a Mighty, right? Mina? Oh, no, Mighty. Mighty 7550, a 2011 Silver Frontier Nissan pickup license plate. Always oh, representing 42763. Uh, 1994 red Nissan hard body. You see another hard body. Uh, A630. And he lives on 769 Tokyo Kenyatta Loop. Copy. Oh, he lives far in Tokyo. Like, that's far. So you have to like go through lots of roads to get here. Norman Lee Parker, level one offender, born in 1966, is fat. He's convicted in 1989. Oh my God, look at the victim, Troy. A first degree, oh shit. First degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony, a one year old female. So first degree CSC as a first degree felony is why is he why is he out of jail? If I'm not mistaken, that involves penetration. Um, was conviction date was in 1989. Wow. Uh, this guy lives on 133 Deda Circle. Let's see. Uh, this is the area kind of across Harvest. Right, you go in where the store's at. Yeah, there's a store. This is the store right yeah. here, right? Toto Mart. Toto Mart. So it's a turn right before the store? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. One years old was the victim. That's it for Totu. And rounding out MTM. So that's uh, 12 plus times 21. Plus, I think there's only two in my team. Yeah, there's only two. Greg Anthony Cruz is a level one offender. Born in 1962. I don't know how the hell he's able to have a jawline like that and he weighs 216 pounds. Because he's 5'11". Yo, Very that's tall. yo. Josh is 5'11 and 250 pounds, I think. No way. Yes. 250 pounds? Shh. You're not fat, Josh. Because he's fat. <laughs> <laughs> Convicted in 2015 of second-degree criminal sexual conduct 
as a first degree felony, how is he not in jail? And another count of the same second degree BSP as a first degree felony, his victim was a 14 year old female. Um, he's employed uh, in Pocket or somewhere along Route 15. Um, he lives at 212 Robot Street. I swear I thought that it was Barragata. Robat. Robit. Robat. Yeah. Robit Street. You don't say Robat. Oh, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna master <laughs> that, like, ever. That's a demo? No, this is, uh... So that's Cars Plus. This is um, Lemai Cafe. Mm -hmm. So the next road, where the where that uh, sewing place is, right? Where the old old Coast 360 or? Oh yeah, yeah. Union? There's the old Coast 360, yeah, right? Yeah. In that road. Oh, I had no idea there were houses back there. Yeah, remember when they had that little hotel motel back there? No. What's what the was it called? What was it called, Prim? No. Auntie, Auntie Pipe would know. Auntie Bobby would know. Wait, there was a motel back yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Pipe feel like I've lost some fucking street cred. No, no. they called it something else, Prim. Red Baron. Micronesian Hotel is where Cars Plus is. Red Baron. No. Yeah, yeah. No, this is behind Red Baron. There was a hotel there. Auntie Pipe would know because she used to live there. Auntie Pipe. Yes, <laughs> that, that kind of <laughs> Auntie Pipe. That's exactly, it, it's exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> no, so Auntie Pipe. We should Auntie probably Pipe. <laughs> never ever say her name for real. Uh, Roland... Carl Pablo Villaverde Jr., level one offender, born in 1984. He was convicted in 2004. Uh, two counts of second degree criminal sexual conduct as a first degree felony and one count of third degree criminal sexual conduct as a second degree felony over an 11 year old female victim. He is employed, uh, this is the ITC area, right? 720 South Marine Corps Drive? I don't know. Yeah, I think that it, that, I think that is the ITC building actually. Copy one. He lives at one four zero. Tetris. Tetris. <laughs> what is that? Tetris. Tetris. Tetris Street, number C dash one. Why do I feel like this is gonna be like it's gonna take us to Zimbabwe? Oh, okay, well. Could it have been Taurus Street? <laughs> so the map is taking us to Taurus Street, which is in the back of every, it's, it's, it's behind where Auntie Pipe used to live. <laughs> in the back back. Let's see. Not Auntie Pie. So Pipe. Auntie Pipe. He used to live in this area. Well, apparently, there was a motel that I had no idea existed. I will get you the name of that motel. It's too late. Uh, I have no use for it anymore. <laughs> so, um, this guy, Roland, apparently lives in this building in number C-1. Is this Roy T. Damian Street still? Yeah, right. And this is the confusing area here, right? Is this a pipeline or is this just a road? Oh, and this is right off of um, uh, Totu Gardens. Okay. Alrighty then. Uh, and that completes Mong Mong Totu Maiti's sex offender registry. 
Uh, if you guys have any suggestions on what should be the next village we go to, just let us know, and we'll go there. Um, <sighs> Anything else? No. No? We good? We are good for tonight. Good night, Guam. Good night, everybody.